dawn is slowly beginning to break. There's a light fog throughout the trees. There's squirrels scurrying around looking for acorns. I can hear the crunching of hooves in oak leaves. Crunch, crunch, crunch. And what steps out? It's sweet November. This is Deer and Deer Hunting TV. Most of you watching don't have large parcels of land. You don't have an abundance of spare time to hit the deer woods each fall. And on average, you maybe have one or two good stands you're able to choose between. So how do you decide which week to take off of work each year? Do you go for the early season? The rut, maybe? Bold enough to try the late season? Well, for now, let's answer that question by saying that if you haven't approached your hunting season in terms of phases of whitetail behavior, then you may want to stick around a few minutes. When you get to September, your deer behavior is still in that summer pattern. So when you're hunting bucks, obviously these bucks come into September normally, in most of the whitetail country, in bachelor groups. That testosterone rises, these deer start breaking up a little bit. You're mostly on feeding patterns. So that's how you're gonna focus your September hunting. In October, they start to get the itch for the rut and we see them starting to build scrapes and rubs and putting out their calling cards, paying attention to the neighbors, sparring a little bit. And you can actually take advantage of that by hunting in key areas where you're finding scrapes and rubs and watch for those bucks that are finding the pecking order within the herd that's in the area. And then in November, it's the rut and the gloves are off for you and the deer. And the deer are having the time of their life as they're hooking up every day with a different doe. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> November is also key because once the rut kicks in, big bucks can show up from anywhere. You might not have seen a big deer all year and all of a sudden with the rut activity, you got a hot doe on your property, an active scrape, and all of a sudden Mr. Big shows up out of the blue. November is a different animal, not just for the deer, but just everything. Coming up next, what to do if the early season doesn't work out the way you hoped. And then, Mark Kaiser blocks off his calendar in November for a state that's near and dear to his heart, Kansas. You're watching Deer and Deer Hunting TV. The early season provides you with the ability to hunt bucks while they are still patternable. But by no means does that constitute an easy hunt. Often we either don't see the buck we want or we don't get a shot opportunity with the time we have available to us. Either way, don't fret. Where there's legal days to hunt, there's hope. It doesn't look good. If you haven't found success in September, don't despair. I know it can get discouraging. You see these big deer, you almost lay ownership claim to them as you're heading into September. You've got all your trail camera pictures. Don't give up because the good stuff is happening. Temperatures start to get colder. Deer want to feed more. They're looking for high protein food sources. Wherever the does go, you know you're going to find bucks. November's that magic month. Follow the does and the buck's nose will be right behind them. So whether it's food, rutting activity, um, if you've got does, pay attention to everything they're doing. Pay attention to the small bucks that are chasing them, to does that are acting randy, and always stay on guard for that big buck to show up. Of course, with all the benefits of the rut, well, there's some things that are not quite as beneficial to you, and that's the lockdown period. And that can be frustrating too, because that big buck that you've been seeing on your camera day after day after day, suddenly disappears. And then you're thinking, did my neighbor shoot him? Did, did he travel across the road? Did he get hit by a car? Where did that big buck go? Well, a lot of times it's just lockdown. And that means that buck has taken a doe that's in estrus and moved off into a place where he's not gonna get harassed by 17 other two and a half year old deer pestering him around. Now is the buck moving? Where's the doe moving over there? 
I sometimes think it's the does actually picking those spots out, but regardless, they're going into lockdown. And the other thing you have to really pay attention to and understand is that that home territory, you know, the one mile by one mile territory you've been taught since you were this high in hunting camp, that really expands. And there's been a lot of GPS research now that shows that those deer will go way beyond that one mile, maybe two miles, maybe three miles. In the Great Plains in the West, they may go five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten miles away from where they spent their summer. But research shows that those deer come back after a few days. They'll find a doe breeder, then they'll make a swing back into their home territory and then out again on a little jaunt, again looking to hook up. So you can either stand your ground, stay in your traditional tree stand, it's a good chance a deer will come in, or you can move around a little bit to some of these lesser known spots, a little bit thicker cover, a little bit remoter area, and you probably have just about as good of luck. Every fall, I try to get down to Kansas and hunt at least a week, if not two, trying to find a Kansas giant. Got a great friend down there, Greg Gilman. He's a, he's a realtor in the area. In fact, he specializes in wildlife hunting properties. People are managing their properties all over this part of Kansas now. So even if you don't have that big buck on your property, come November 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, a big buck could stroll in from anywhere looking for an estra stove. Day one, who strolls in? Right under my tree stand, but Junior, he's a beautiful five by five, and he was spending a lot of time chasing does under my stand, from 25 to 30 yards, all the way down to 15 yards. But I just couldn't bring myself on my first day of the hunt to put an arrow in it. Now, I gotta be honest, I made a mistake there. That deer was a stud. And from then on, my encounters with that deer were sparse and limited and always distant. I could have had the hunt of a lifetime within a few hours of being in a stand and I was boots on the ground in Kansas and I elected to pass. But that's hunting. You make your decisions and you live with them. It's day one of a dream hunt in Kansas. A beautiful five by five walks by and gives you all day to make a perfect shot. What do you do? Well, generally speaking, the rule for many hunters is that you should never pass up a buck on day one that you would gladly shoot on the last sit. That said, if you've ever made a hard decision to pass up a buck before, then you felt the heart rate that comes with that choice and the anxiety of not knowing whether or not you made the right decision as your hunt starts to near its end. No one is immune to uncertainty when it comes to whitetail hunting. No one. Days two, three, and four passed by rather quickly and I really didn't get in close to any bucks. We were checking trail cameras, checking the different blinds, putting up some new stands, making sure everything was in place and making sure we were getting all the intel. That's when Greg pointed out another buck. He said, this older five by five is I think one of the bucks you should target. He's, he was short on a couple of his points, but had decent mass and good height on his brows and his twos and threes. I was game and this deer was a player. He was showing up everywhere. So that was going to be my focus buck. Back down in my oak, little oak hollow down there where I just loved to go, my target buck showed up. He came in quartering to me, never giving me a good broadside shot. And if there's one thing I've learned after all of these years of bow hunting is always wait for the perfect shot. Overnight, the forecast changed to almost 100% rain the next morning. It was foggy that morning, still drizzling. We got in the blinds, set up. Over an hour had passed. It was probably almost an hour and a half into two hours. And Greg was thinking maybe nothing was gonna happen. Maybe we should just get out, go check some other cameras, 
think about a new plan for the afternoon, went out of the corner of his eye and said, oh, here comes a deer. Right below us, out of some cedar trees, comes the buck. I didn't wait. He was going to pass right under the blind. Got to be honest, the hit was farther back than I wanted. I was jacked up. I was excited. But the last sight of that buck, he was really hurt. He was walking off. And this here whole thing here, this is the Flynn Hills of Kansas. This is all canyons. He's not going to want to go off any of these cliffs if he doesn't have to. And he went right to a cliff face. So hopefully he held up there, tipped over. That's the hope anyway. Right there. Whew. That's just a load off my mind. Yeah. He didn't go anywhere at all. I can practically see the blind from right here. This is why I love coming to Kansas. Good genetics, big bucks, great management. And not only is Greg doing some really good management here, but his neighbors are. They're all doing good management. So you got bucks crisscrossing property lines, and this is the result. I hit him just a tad far back, but I thought the shot was good enough that it hit enough vitals, and the arrow showed frothy blood, good red blood. This buck did not go anywhere. I couldn't be happier with Kansas. It's always on my hit list. It's a great destination to hunt. Beautiful bucks, gorgeous country and good friends here in Kansas. Okay, I'm gonna be perfectly honest with you. You know, these blinds, yes, they are comfortable, but they stick out like a sore thumb. And I don't, I'm not gonna give you any marketing spiel about, oh, that doesn't bother the deer and they don't notice it. Yes, they do notice it. They know the blind is there. However, deer will get used to this blind no different than they'll get used to a farmer's hay bale sitting in the field. But you know, when the moment of truth comes and hunting season comes, it doesn't take much for those deer to pick up that, yeah, there's danger there because somebody's walking around and putting scent out. So that's how we minimize our scent. We, we spray ourselves down before we come in. We take all those scent-free approaches to get in this blind. But regardless if this is on the ground or up on a platform, you know, they sell those platforms, they're nice or 10 feet off the ground. It's awesome. That does help with scent control. I still insist that this thing be as dark as possible when I'm hunting inside of here because a deer can see, they're going to see movement and they're going to see things shining. So what I, what I do in any one of these types of situations is I will pick probably two spots that are wind advantageous for me that I think the deer's going to show up there or I think the deer's going to show up there or that's where I'm going to get my shots. And the rest of these windows for me are going to be blacked out. Now, the easy way for me to do it, there's fancy ways to do it, and there's the Dan Schmidt red neck way of doing it. I just get myself, basically this is gardening cloth, you put it down to prevent weeds, weed barrier they call it. And I bring a roll of this with me if I'm hunting in one of these semi-permanent blinds. And I will just basically pin this between the window and the, the, the opening. And then I'll shut those windows and yes, I might pinch it a little bit so I can maybe see a little corner, but just a little bit if I want to be able to see a deer coming through. That's going to keep this black all the way around, and it's going to really make it hard for a deer to see in here. Because, you know, they don't have that 3D depth of vision that we do. Theirs is more like 2D. And if it starts, you start getting shadows in the afternoon, and now the rest of this thing is black inside, I can get away with a lot. 
as far as movement. One thing I will not do is have all these windows open because I want to see all the way around me. I'm not going to do that. Number one for scent and number two, I'm not going to do it basically for the vision. I want to be as stealth as possible and keep myself as low profile as possible when hunting. You know, there's a lot of new products out there that are going to help you no matter what you're doing, if you're bow hunting or gun hunting. And those products are so innovative these days that you really can't go wrong, right? You know, you, you, you pick out a new arrow, a new broadhead, and it's going to work. But when you really get down into that and you decide what's going to be best for you, you have to decide when it comes to bow hunting, whether it's speed, you know, accuracy, or knock down, you know, kinetic energy. I prefer to go with all three. The FMJ from Easton, that's the arrow that I've been shooting for about 10 years now, comes in with regular arrow when I'm shooting my compound bow or a crossbow bolt when I'm shooting my crossbows. The nice thing about these arrows is you get the stability of a carbon core. Basically, this is two arrows built in one. You have a carbon core, which is wrapped with what the name is, a full metal jacket. So when you look at accuracy, the best accuracy we ever had was out of straight aluminum arrows, right? But when you start getting to these really high speed, high efficient bows, those old style aluminum arrows just wouldn't cut it. So that's why Easton came up with this idea. Lightweight carbon arrows, you get the speed, but then you get that extra beefiness with that metal jacket. I'm just gonna give you a couple numbers here. The arrows that I shoot are the 340s. You have to look at the spine chart to decide which one is right for your bow. But this is 11 grains per inch. If you compare that to a standard carbon arrow that's out there today, a lot of those carbon arrows are as light as six grains up to about eight grains per inch. That's a huge difference. So when you go 29 inches on mine, 11 grains per inch on this FMJ, 319 grains, they have these new half outserts which really help with penetration and stability in front of center of the arrow. That outsert is 50 grains. The micro light knock is six grains. The bully veins, which I really like, these little two inch veins, uh, three of those together is another 19 and a half grains. I threw a hundred grain sever on this. Now this is a number that's gonna impress you. 494 and a half grains, just shy of 500 grains on that arrow. That's a lot of force, a lot of downrange kinetic energy that's gonna create those pass-throughs that I want when I'm out there deer hunting. Check them out, that's the new FMJ. These are the four millimeters from Easton Archery.